Alrighty then. Got it all set up to go out of this parking spot in this busy alleyway where nobody drives slow. And it's another hot one today. Not really another one, but it's been flirting with getting back to sweatshirt weather. It's been a little bit cold at night, but then today it pops up as 88 degrees right now, 2.49 in the afternoon. Anyways, this is the last official away game today as we move towards uh, playoffs. And I'm reminding that I do really love coaching because I believe like three or four weeks ago I started going through my head about how many more away games we would have and how many more opportunities I would have to enjoy a drive by myself, go get some junk food, go sit and watch two of our games and then coach one of our games. And um, fortunately that last away game that we had probably was the day of the last episode uh, I put up, we lost, we choked that game, we lost in five uh, to a team that had only won one game thus far in league, but they caught us and we choked. Uh, one big factor that didn't help the girls out was the hair in my mouth, no not that, ah. The uh, one of our starting outsides did not come to the match she was sick apparently and so we had to replace her for an entire night and that ended up being a big a big struggle for us uh it, the passing suffered the numbers attacking suffered and um we just were not mentally on brand the whole night and uh, I've been coaching long enough that unfortunately there's always one or two times where that happens and in retrospect looking back you you also realize that as a coach you did not address that feeling at the, the time of or on the day and um, it just didn't go right or feel right from the start and uh, we can use those unfortunately as things to point back to but you hope that you don't have to have a game like that where you sacrifice kind of all for me uh in the boys season last year that that um that little game ended up being one single set but it was at our own tournament where we were doing well and there was coaches that were making comments like, you guys are the real deal, or we looked good, or like, we don't, if we're not good, we don't really ever get those comments. But um, when Carlos told me that, I was pretty excited inside. And uh, even though you know, you kind of have an idea how you are, but you really don't know until you start playing teams. And, uh, and it ended up being a team that we had swept earlier in the season at home. And I'd say pretty handedly the first two sets. I want to say like 12 or 13. And then the third set we got a little lax days ago, but we still pulled it out like 21 or 22. But yeah, no, we sat, the you know, maybe a little too long, which happens at our tournament. And then we were not ready for battle right away. And it was just not going well right away and we were pressing really really hard trying to force five points into one and we just came up too short and they just were loose and they were chopping wood and uh, that one really sucked because we had it a buy and if we would have won that one set then we would have made it to the I want to say the quarterfinals or yeah and maybe the semifinals I don't think we would have gotten past the team in the semis but for that quarters, but it still would have been, I mean, the farthest I've ever taken a team. Um, so I am kicking myself for that. And that's, you know, I can point to that as a teachable moment for myself and for my team that year. And I was thinking about today, what, I, what was I going to talk about? Um, and in regards to coaching, I think I would just try and recant, recall, uh, you know, every 
year of my coaching um, career thus far and maybe things that I learned uh, those years and I thought it couldn't be that hard so I'm thinking we're going to take it all the way back to 2008 and that was the year that I graduated from college and that was I'm sorry that was the year I graduated from college and got my teaching credential and got my teaching credential in, yeah, in May or June of 2008, and, uh, then I did not look very hard for a teaching job at all, (laughs) um, I don't think I looked at all, actually, I got my letters of recommendation, kind of, I think, um, but did not go and look and submit anything. I got a little job in the summer. My roommate was already working at a parking garage in downtown San Diego. It was a parking in the company. It was called Five Star Parking. And we were just the people in the little booth that take your ticket or raise the lever or um, take the money when you pay for parking. And so he was already working there. And, uh, he said he'd put in a good word and could probably get me a job there and at that time I was still smoking weed like every day and drinking and still living a college lifestyle and um, <clears throat> to me the just utilizing my connections which meant I had to walk five feet to my roommate's room and ask him uh, seemed easier than actually going and trying to find a teaching job with the um Credential I had just earned, aka my parents paid for it, paid for me, and I hung in there long enough and I didn't fuck up long enough that they gave me a piece of paper that said, this guy could technically uh, watch over a group of teenagers and teach them something. But um, I always knew deep down that is not really what I'm super passionate about. I had convinced myself that I could do it. I went through student teaching, and lo and behold, I could do it. But at no point was I ever excited to to really go to work as much as I'm excited to go to the gym and practice or go to the gym for a match or go to a tournament for a one- or two-day tournament, which is really, that's my favorite thing, our tournaments. So anyways, I worked at Five Star um, Parking from... Yeah, I want to say like June or July until about um, November or so. It was probably about three months, maybe four months. But um, I, it was pretty, it was pretty like menial. Like I said, I sat there and I took tickets and raised a live a lever and I got paid minimum wage or maybe a little bit above. I believe I got paid nine dollars or like nine twenty five. Um, and which worked out fine because I lived in a condo that my parents owned and I didn't pay rent. And, uh, so everything I was making was just pretty much, I just used and Um, I worked like six days a week, I believe. I believe it was, and I was not, it was not a full 40. It was, uh, like, yeah, 38 or 36 or something just enough for them to not pay us benefits, and, uh, yeah, my shift, oh, gosh, my shift, let's talk about the shift hours, it was 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., woo-wee, what a shift, right, do absolutely nothing all day, and then drag my ass (laughs) down to work, and, like, I believe I would try to leave around 1.37 or so and get down there. Um, and then Saturdays I would work, like, what was it, 8.30? I want to say 8.30 to 5 o'clock or something. And on a Saturday, is not a day where it's busy at all. So it was literally, Saturdays were the most difficult because there was just no action, hardly any action at all. A few people would come in, uh, and that, on the weekends... I would have to uh, press the button that would raise the uh, the um, 
not the curtain, but the basically the garage thing that would close down out to the street. You know, during the week, it stays it stays open. People are coming in and out, but on the weekend, you open the little uh, arm so they can go up the the um, the little hill to get out of the parking garage. And literally, I'm opening I'm opening it up so they can get out to the street. And, uh, so yeah, that day was just a drag. So I'm working this job, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's safe to say my parents were not impressed for sure. Um, and at the time my mom was teaching third grade still. And then my former, uh, my, my, one of my former JV coaches, I had him for two years was now the varsity coach back at my high school and uh, just coincidentally his daughter was in third grade that year and she was in my mother's class and she was she's a great person a great student there was hardly anything to talk to academically I'm sure that she was like struggling with or whatever um, she's since graduated from Boise State of I want to say f- two or three years ago and works in hotel management she's killing it so they're having a parent-teacher conference, and uh, and his wife was also my English teacher for a few months in junior high. She ended up being a assistant principal at the high school that I go to. So, um, I mean, just another reiteration that we live in a small small town. But anyways, they're having the parent-teacher conference, uh, conference and uh, uh, obviously, I come up as a subject of conversation by, you know, I'm sure after they talk about daughter and, and my coach inquires about what I'm doing. And my mom says, I just graduated. And I'm, I'm sure she said, I'm looking for jobs. Uh, sorry, mom. I wasn't. Um, but also that I was just working in a parking garage or whatever. And, uh, he mentioned that if he ever wants to come coach volleyball, he could, I could come, come back and be a frosh soft coach or be some I think she just said if I ever want to be a coach um no it must have been frosh soft coach because that must have been what was needed that year um and I think I was just waiting for a reason to come back to be honest um I was not very happy working in that that spot and I think I also did miss my family. I, I told people that, and it was part of the truth. Um, because we, we are... Uh, I always considered my life pretty boring, my family situation pretty boring, just because, um, for the most part, we get along. My parents are, are married. They're still married. Um, we It's just me and my brother. We both grew up and, and graduated high school. We both went on to, uh, you know, education after college or after high school. My brother does have his, um, his AA from the local city college. Um, even though what he got, that didn't really pertain to what he's doing now. Um, but, but he's killing it. He's, he's a small business owner and, uh, I, he is my boss. I currently work for him now. Um, but um, yeah, a boy like we, uh, yeah, we just didn't, we didn't have a lot of drama growing up. I think because my, both my parents are very focused and hardworking and they, they kept us on a, uh, on the straight and narrow for the most part. I think if there was any fuckery, it was 99% my, my doing, um, <laughs> and, and even that, even when I compare myself to other, other people's like fuckery, it wasn't that, that gnarly. Um, I was a, I was a pretty, pretty good functioning, um, stoner. Um, even when it got really, I'd say for me, like out of hand, I still, I still was maintaining like a, 3.8 3.8 or something, and I graduated high school with a 3.86 GPA. It would have cont- it would have been a 4.0 if I didn't um, if I didn't <laughs> show up to zero period statistics and trig just baked a lot. Although I don't know that 
that is a hard, difficult subject, and I never, I never really liked math, anyways. But that's beside the point. Um, but yeah, well, was, I don't know why I was talking about having a boring, uh, oh, but boring life. But uh, we spent a lot of time together as a family. Uh, we did a lot of like boating vacations, to, like Lake San Antonio, Lake Nas, or we'd go to um, uh, the lake out there in Nevada. Um, we did a lot of stuff together on the weekends. And then I was involved in club soccer and club volleyball, um, like since first grade all the way through, uh, 12th grade. So really I didn't, we were not latchkey kids by any sense of the word. Um, maybe just a little bit when, when, when we were, we could both drive, but even then was, uh, I had curfews and I had to. I had to be home by a certain time to have dinner or I would have to like make sure I would clear my plans about dinner with my folks like the morning of or the day before like they weren't super chill people about um, me calling them on the phone around dinner time and then adjusting the plans or whatever um, they just like to have some heads up and that's a good quality I can I'm definitely going to follow through with that type also and so um but I don't think I really realized how much um I miss just that that closeness of family until um until I moved away which was the only time I had moved away um but uh you know once I was done with college and I mean I wasn't just like furiously consumed with being high and drunk and trying to get uh girls all the time um when the prospect of like real life and getting a job and having a job and all that was hitting, I was, I think, uh, panicking a little bit. And also I was not really making a huge effort to, um, so, and I, when I was saying I was, I was, I was kind of waiting for some, some shoe to drop. I think just the possibility of, of volleyball is that being something to bring me back. That was something I, I think I jumped at. I think, I think I thought about it for, I want to say two weeks, but I, I feel like I thought about it for about five minutes and then decided in my head. And then, um, and then I want to say I, I talked to my f folks or something. I remember talking to my dad and asking him if, if I could move home and I started crying on the phone. I was talking to him and <laughs> I think he kind of giggled which is funny because he is <laughs> he's he's more of the crier than I um but but I that's what brought me back and uh and also I could substitute also which my mom helped helped me do uh meeting like doing all the paperwork and whatnot so I felt like, um, at least at my own high school, I knew, I knew teachers and I, I knew my way around. It was familiar and I had done like some of my observation hours in town with a teacher that I knew. And, um, so I think I felt that that would, um, that would please uh, my folks a little bit that if I came back, I could substitute and coach. And um, so I came back in, I want to, it was November ish of, uh, it must have been November or maybe late October. I don't remember if it was after Halloween or not. It must have been after, but I know I came back in time to. Um, watch my first high school volleyball match that I saw when I got back to town was was my school versus our other rival school and both schools had made it to the CIF finals of the division they were competing at and they played in Rob Jim at UCSB and uh, it was packed it was it was so cool to to be back in and to see both our squads doing it. And now that I think about it, I, I think that was the, that might've been the, the top of the girls program that our school has ever 
has ever been was just coincidentally it'd be the time when I came back because the following year so we got swept by our rivals at you know in town for the for CIF finals the following year um, our our school went back to the CIF finals for that division and they won and they put a banner up that was 2009 and Ton of series of events thrust my one of my good friends into being the head coach of that 2009 squad, and he uh, put the banner on the wall, and he has the ring at home, and um, he's super humble about it, as he was, you know, kind of thrust into a situation that, you know, talking with them years later ended up being very stressful. But from the outside looking in, it did. It seemed like it must. Everyone kind of assumed, and I, I kind of assumed too that it was probably so much fun and so easy. But that is not the case. But um, but that's when I came back to town, and when I came back to town, and then I would start going to first period volleyball because my old coach was was now the teacher of that class, and um, it was one consistent thing I could do every morning as I was waiting for all my paperwork to get cleared and um, I could be there every day at 8 o'clock and just being in the gym, being back there being reminded of how much fun and how many good times I had there the, you know, the four years that I was a student there and a player there and then the three years that I um, watched my brother play It, it is I had to help. I don't have to I don't have to I don't have to tell anyone because I I know and I I didn't know that for a long time I didn't know that it was just okay that uh, I knew And if I'm the only person that knows, that's, that's okay. And I didn't know that for, um, for a long time, up until, like, recently, I guess. Maybe just, like, the last year, but, um, it's, I guess it's a place where uh, I found myself and I feel comfortable and I I spent so much time there and I just I love it and I I I didn't know how much it meant, I guess, until I left. And then I might have, I might have went in there a few times the, like, six years. The six and a half years I was gone. Just a little over six years. It was, I'm going to say August of, August of 2002 until, yeah, November of 2008. But, um. That was what was so hard about the pandemic also was just couldn't go, just couldn't go there. So, um, so 
basically I just I just went and and, and played and I think I don't think I was ever worried about like whether I was like would know how to do it again um cause I was never the best player I'm still not um but I just I forgot how much fun it was you know indoor I've never felt the excuse me I've never felt the same way about uh sand volleyball I just don't I need to see the I need to see the fury of somebody getting roofed and it hitting the gym floor or just annihilating a ball or somebody limping it just because it gets hit so much harder and there's the more bodies there's more action to be to be made um so yeah I'm in I'm in the uh I'm in the I'm in the I'm in the gym playing in the mornings I don't even know what I was doing in the afternoon or the rest of the day excuse me probably just chilling watching TV and eating food and whatnot. Um, and then, yeah, I think I was, I became the Frosh Soft coach um, in the spring, and uh, so I would substitute as, as much as they could give me during the week, and then, and then I was coaching after school almost, I want to say almost right away. I believe we started practice at 3.30 or 4, but, um, I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I, all I knew was what I knew from from being a player, uh, which was just four years of high school, two years of indoor club and beach clinics that I and the, a little minute minim, minimal minimal amount of beach that I had done. And what I really knew that I what I really uh, noticed that I didn't know is I didn't I didn't know about mechanics, um, and I don't think I ever really for a few years, uh, for many years, I don't think even, I don't think until I started coaching varsity and maybe a few years into that, did I even start thinking about, uh, mechanics. How's your body supposed to be positioned? How are you supposed to look when you start? What are your fingers and, and shoulders supposed to be doing here and there? What does your footwork supposed to be like? And are you supposed to be squaring up? And now I was just, I was just coaching for, um, we're out here and we will get better because we're touching the ball a lot. And uh, I think another thing that really solidified my passion for the uh, for the sport um, coaching that year was that I got blessed with the team. And I know I've talked about this many times, but I was blessed with a team that was phenomenal. They were so, so very experienced and well beyond the, the curve of of kids learning how to play. I basically got handed, I'd say six kids that all knew what to do and they could pass, they could set, they could hit. We were running ones, uh, at the, at that time. And, uh, yeah, I think I got like three kids that were already playing club. Uh, one kid was the younger brother of a kid of a younger brother of a dude that was on varsity and then another kid was the son of a dude that played at Dos Bubbles and played in college, I believe. And the kid was really talented already as a freshman. Um, I mean, basically, half of the kids that got left with me could have been on the JV team, but the JV team was super junior heavy, and um, it was kind of different back then. We would keep more sophomores than juniors on JV. I've kind of. I've tried to, I've tried to go away from that. I'm trying to take less sophomores on Frosh and less juniors on JV. Um, but anyways, yeah, I had, uh, like three kids play Frosh again. And one was a setter. One was an outside libero, and then one was was a kid that hit it really hard, and he kind of played middle, and he kind of played outside. And he actually ended up being a dude that was 
kind of a in and out guy. Like he didn't really earn himself a, a solid spot anywhere. But they were so good. Like they were super athletic, and uh, we were jump. We had two, three kids that had awesome jump serves that season too, and we just they. We were so good, so I didn't really have to do much besides be a cheerleader and um, be super hyped, which I didn't know I was going to be like that, but I literally just was a guy that was screaming and yelling and encouraging, and I guess just, I guess the main thing I did was remind guys about what the other team was going to do. But I'd say the biggest thing I learned that year was that um, volume and and being loud and being energetic is a thing that's going to help you. And that's the, been the type of coach I've always been. I've tried to veer away from there and be calm, cool, and collected, but I just, it's just not me and I can't seem to, I can't seem to maintain that type of uh, restraint. And I've, I've had, uh, I had an assistant coach my first four years coaching varsity that was very high energy also. And so it was easy to match that. And um, I'd say the years where I was trying to dial it back was the years that we were super good at the varsity level and where they didn't really need me to be as, as energetic. Uh, but anyways, that first year, yes, uh, my first year coaching in the spring of 2009, I, I'd say I learned that energy was super important. Um, the following year, I was not a head coach. That was, when I think about it, that was the, the only year I've coached boys volleyball where I was an assistant. And I moved up to the JV level. So I moved up with, I moved up with, um, almost all of my guys from my frosh team. And I worked with, uh, it was a coach that had been coaching the year before I came. He took the year off because I want to say his daughters were seniors and, and he wanted to be there to be more of a parent their senior year than be uh, coaching and missing stuff. So he came back and we coached uh, JV together and he was more of like a, uh, he's an older dude, like a, uh, more of a father figure. I've heard him be described in the girls, um, sector. And, uh, I don't even know if he coached men's, uh, boys volleyball after that year, but, um, he was the head and I was the assistant. And then, you know, sometimes he couldn't make matches or practice and then I would take over. But, um, we were, we also, um, got a basketball player to come join us who was just crazy athletic and in three weeks he was making incredible plays and he played middle and um, we just, that, that group just progressed and just became even better and better with each match and uh, that group with me that first year we won every match until the very final match against a rival where we went three and we lost 14-16 on an, one of we had an overpass we crushed it and followed through into the net and that's how we lost um, and we won all three tournaments that year we won a Camarillo Frosh uh, Oxnard Frosh and a uh, Rio Mesa Royal Frosh tournament and that first season was just so it was so much fun obviously when you win you know, 98%, all but one of your matches, it's, it's not going to be that boring, but, um, what a journey it was, and it was, I, I just got hooked, and I think I probably told myself, man, what if this is every season, winning all the tournaments, so the next year, that second year, when I was coaching, and I was the assistant, we won our first two JV tournaments, and, we go, we go down to the most difficult tournament we'd had ever played at down in Newport Harbor, and I want to say we got third or fourth. 
or maybe even we got bounced in the quarters. Um, and I remember I went and I cried outside because for, of the, this being the sixth tournament I was coaching at, um, we did not win it. And I thought I was going to get maybe like fired because we didn't win. <laughs> um, but that in that second year, being the assistant coach, I got a lot of complaints uh, that came my way. Complaints about playing time, complaints about the head coach, and just, I don't know, I, I'm assuming it's, they, it was more of them just being more comfortable with me because I was their coach the year before and I was younger, but also I, I learned, I learned that when you're the head coach, you're, you're people are going to talk shit about you. Um, people will also say say nice things about you, but it'll all, you know, a lot of times it'll happen behind your back, and that that's normal. And um, as an assistant coach, you've you've just got to, you know, be transparent with your with your head coach. And um, another thing I I'm, I'm learning is that your job as an assistant coach is to give some feedback or give a nugget to your head coach that so that they can they can give the team that nugget so that it's so that the players take that and they're motivated and it doesn't matter that it came from you or it came from the head coach and and that's something something I've never been um, egotistical about one iota I've always been super um, transparent that like Whatever like opinion I have that I tell my head coach and they use it and it comes from them, I don't care whose ownership it is. I like to hear and see that players are responding to that and um, that's the mark of a good assistant coach. Now, I don't know if, I don't know if I take nuggets from my assistant coaches because I'm so aware of that, but yeah, I, and I don't even know if what I'm saying is explained quite right, but um, sometimes as a head coach, you don't you don't have everything you need to say all the time. But um, hey, you, you got to bounce ideas off, or you want to hear what your your um, assistants have to say. And if you like that, you can take it, take with it, and run with it. Um, I think I more throw the ball to my assistant coaches more than I, um, take nuggets, um, I don't know if if there's a difference or not, but, yeah, I, I think I, that, that thing about, uh, about the head coach, I remember just, yeah, not, and I think that's just being, um, aware in life that not everyone's gonna like you, and that's okay, because it's what's best for the team and the team's success, not that everybody likes you. Um, so the following year, 2011, then I became, uh, I became, <clears throat> excuse me, that was the year I started assisting a junior, a junior varsity girls team, but also I was a head coach of of a JV team by myself, and I don't think I kept any of my, I think this was the first year that I had a bunch of new players, and that year, I I can't really remember how, how, uh, how well we did that year, but, um, I remember being a little too loose, uh, in the beginning stages of that year. I think I was trying to be too nice and too friendly and I was not which has always been I'm still struggling with that even to to this day Um, establishing boundary the 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 coaching boundaries and 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 not wanting to be although it's getting a lot easier because I just don't care as much anymore but um I just remember those first few practices it being a little bit chaotic and I feeling like I didn't have a great classroom management of the whole situation and I was still just kind of like a coach that was there and super energetic and utilizing the athletes we had and 
but I don't really think I was teaching very much mechanics or understanding, but just we were going to have a good time and we were going to get after it. And uh, so, yeah, and then the girl season ends up in the fall, so that was... That was my third uh, boys' season in the spring, and then jumped to the the, um, the fall. And I was assistant coaching fall 2011. I'm pretty sure a, a JV girls team with one of my friends, who's who's a uh, club director now, and he just came back to high school coaching, and he helped um, Archbishop Mitty to like three or four um, CIF championships up there. Um, and just a volley nerd, and I think that's why we hit it off so well in the beginning. And um, he was the first one that I coached with, and I witnessed really um, definitively coaching mechanics. Like, this is how your platform should be positioned. Maybe this is how your feet. This is how we would we're gonna work on our arm swing by having your starting your arm up and tossing. And he had done a lot of um, uh, uh, coaching at like camps, college uh, camps run by colleges, but uh, you know, high school kids would come and he had been a club coach in town for a a little while and and I just I I loved it, man, and I I think it was that year where I realized oh, like mechanics are are kind of important when you're when you're coaching and you're teaching, you these are things that that are going to make a difference. Just like where you start on the court um, and where you transition to, those are important things too. And so, yeah, my guy, I I, I learned so much from coaching with him. I, I coached, I JV coached, I JV assisted him for two seasons and then um, by, by 2013, yeah, so... So, and then 2012, I, um, 2012, I had, I had, uh, another, I was JV coach of, uh, boys again, and that season, pretty sure we went, like, undefeated, except for tournaments, but we won, we won every game, we won a tournament, too. And, uh, I remember that it was our serving and passing that was so consistent that year that allowed us to do a lot of different things. I remember I had one player that was, he was a sophomore that year and he had been with me on the team as a freshman, um, on JV. And then Fortunately, he would be with me again his junior year, and then he would move up with me his fourth year on the varsity. So poor guy, and I coached him in club volleyball. So fortunately, that guy had to be coached by me five times. So, um, and I'd say half of those years I probably didn't teach him much. But that year we learned serve and pass that, and um, the importance of a libero. And uh, I learned that the short serve was fucking badass that year and that the giving the libero a lot of responsibility is is a good thing and there was quite a few uh, times that season where uh, the free ball comes over everybody clear out and let the libero get it everybody clear out let the libero get it and then that's the way we ran it it worked out fairly well almost (laughs) It, it worked out fairly well almost all the No, it worked out well, and we tra- we converted a lot of free balls and easy balls just because he was so such a solid, solid uh, guy back there. And we I played him middle back, too, and so he got the brunt of a lot. Um, so I'd say that serve pass and the libero position is oh so important that uh, in, in the game of volleyball. And jump to 2013, the following year, is when I, uh, I got, I coached, I coached JV, um, as the head for the girls for the first time, 
and um, I remember the previous year was um, I had a lot of kids I helped my same friend we both coached a club team of an 18s the first year and a 15s the second year but we had um, this was coming off of the second year the 15s and so I was gonna have I think three or four of the girls that were on the club team would now be on my JV team and I remember telling them that uh, I don't owe you anything just because we had been together for like eight months on a club team and I think just saying that out loud made a made an impact in my mind and it's been something that I try to remind myself and players that you're not owed anything and that you've got to earn your spot on this court. You've got to earn it. Um, and that comes in practice. And I think that the importance of practice has, has never been so um, illustrated for me uh, until I had until I had a situation where um, people would probably be expecting me to play all the kids that were on my club team on the club team I uh, played before but it's really you it's got to be it's got to be earned and it's got to be um, established that just because you play club does not guarantee anything it might not even guarantee you even got better and that might be that's kind of a complaint I hear sometimes from people that play club is that they're not being taught or coached you know and I think there's a there's thinking that you should be because you're paying for all this but um unfortunately it doesn't go like that all the time um and then the uh the following spring was would be the the year that I uh got the job as the boys varsity coach so I only um I only head coached uh, one frosh team and two JV teams, uh, uh, boys teams before I, before I was, um, the varsity coach in 2014, and, um, what I learned that season was that, um, not being the varsity coach is a lot more fun, or is not as fun, uh, yes, not being the varsity coach is fun, because all you gotta do is just coach, um, but, you know, being the varsity coach, now you are, you're the head of a program, you oversee all of it, you find your coaches, you order the unis, uniforms, you do the scheduling, and um, it's a lot of work, and so I was not prepared for all that, and I want to say almost the entire schedule was done for me anyways that year. But, um, but also I realized that season that, um, energy has to be a factor. Uh, I know I made that something that I talked about in the, uh, my first season, but it was reiterated to me at being my first season as a, um, varsity coach that, uh, uh, excuse me, just because you're a varsity coach doesn't mean you can't be obnoxious and jumping around and hooting and hollering, which has been pretty much my my MO uh, most of my coaching career, and it's just kind of the way I attacked it. I still felt, you know, a cloak of imposter syndrome, and I, I definitely knew I didn't deserve the position I was in just yet, but I also learned that it's not really a position that anybody is um, taking for financial gain. It's more of a burden financially than anything, but you've got to really, really love it. But um, I was I was so stoked. I was so stoked. I remember telling somebody at some little like school event that I had just gotten the varsity boys volleyball job, and I said it like they should be impressed, and they were just like, oh, that's congratulations, that's cool. Which meant they didn't really know <laughs> what that meant. And um, to be honest, uh, I didn't really know what that meant. I knew that I was stoked about that. And also, um, rem I also remember thinking that I'm going to do things differently. And that just the witnessing the way that... Uh, that my head coach above me um, had, had uh, 
had done it, I, there were things that I didn't agree with. And that is okay. And that's actually one thing I remember him saying multiple times was that he liked when assistant coaches disagreed with him. I'm thinking because it gave him a, a, a different perspective on what, um, on the situation or, or something. Um, whereas I, I'm going to be honest, I've, I'm kind of a people pleaser a lot, a lot of times, and I'll kind of agree with other coaches, um, I think because, because of my imposter syndrome and, and the fact that I've just always had the, the feeling that, uh, I'm just not the best coach in the gym, nine out of ten times, and that, um, the other coach knows better, which is a, which is a weird, um, feeling when you're quote unquote the the head coach but um you're not the most experienced or knowledgeable coach at the time which I by far wasn't um but makes sense that um somebody has to be the face and someone has to be the name um just as someone is the president of the United States of America but I mean, no one could ever agree upon the fact that they think that person is the most qualified or smartest person for the job, but it's, I guess, the person that can be talked into taking this great responsibility on. And um, all I could think about was was the matches and the tournaments and um, just how fun it looked. So um, I think the my first year on varsity, was, what I learned was I did not know what I was in for (laughs) and um, that second year uh, what was 2014 girls season like oh I was coaching the junior varsity team again that year and that might have been the year I don't know that one's tough. But I know the following boy season in 2015, one thing I definitely learned was you don't have to take players um, just because you want to be nice or you feel sorry for them or you want to do something nice. I took too many dudes that year that did not help us out in practice and did not – they did not get better per se. And uh, I should have – invested in kids younger than them and brought them up and kids that would be um there the following year the year after but I took three seniors that um did not help our progression and um they were rally killers for the most part and I did that I think just because I was trying to be nice and and uh was that was not our best season that's for sure we did not do super well that year I, I still I think we split with Sam Mucus and we got like third we went to the playoffs but we got we got we got dealt with by Miracosta and um, that was uh, that was a tough one to, to, to uh, swallow but um, like I said I definitely learned that you don't have to take everybody um because some people don't deserve to be on varsity because they're just not good enough and (laughs) life goes on people will survive not making the team it might hurt for a day or two but they won't get over it and so um I had to do that again last year and and the teenage boy cried, and uh, but he got over it, and he he was around at matches, and it was not the end of his life. He he survived. It was not it was not the most terrible thing that had ever happened to him. Um, I think the following year in 2015 was a, a another sweet season. Um, we went undefeated in in league and we got first place in league which I used to always try and make a big deal about um and when I was a JV coach was first place 
ch- first place, JV Channel E, first place. Like, not that anybody was keeping track, but I, you know, I pay. I can't not pay attention to that stuff. It drives me, drives me fucking bananas when people don't know what your record is, your overall record and your league record. How hard is it to just remember? Um, maybe they just don't care that much. Um, but that year, I remember we had um, two short girls that both played. They both set and they both played in the front uh, row and they were attackers and they were effective. And that just reiterated the point to me that um, you do not have to be tall to be successful in this sport and that anybody can can play an attacking position in the front. You just, you just got to try. Um, and I mean, rightfully so. This, this season, we one of our outsides is is 5'3", and she's our, of the two outside, she's the best, I mean, of the four outside, she's the best, and, uh, she is the straw that, that stirs the drink, dude, um, but yeah, you don't have to be tall for the sport, and, uh, 2016 season, that was the year where, um, you really, I, I figured out that you need, um, you need, uh, you need position players. Not by positions. I mean, you need people to fill roles. And the roles I figured out were, uh, you need to have a gun, which is a dominant player that you can chuck the ball to. Who, who is an offensive player? I'm sorry, a gun cannot be your setter or your... I mean, I guess it could be set, but your gun cannot be your libero. And I, I guess your gun cannot be... Uh, your middle blocker either, in my opinion, because you can't, you just, you can't force it to the middle uh, unless the pass is there, but you've got to have a pin gun, a dominant guy that can take care of it, and, uh, and I had one that year, and I'd say he was the gun the year before also as a junior, but, um, I didn't know how, um, important that was uh, until, until that year, my first year, we had a pretty spread, spread offense. And the, the, this kid that was eventually going to be the gun the previous two years, he was in 10th grade and he was on the court all the time, but he was not, he had not matured yet. He was not the gun yet. Um, we had a great spread offense. So I had two outsides that were pretty legit. And that kid, the opposite was, was pulling the, pulling in third, third, uh, attempts and ops for that and um and then we had decent middles so it was a well-balanced attack the following year was when he came into his own as a gun and we just pretty much didn't have outsides and kind of had one middle but uh you know I think we didn't have enough talent on the b side to push the a side and so they were not progressing as much um and the gun was just detonating so much in practice that it just did not, just didn't, it didn't really suit well for the team. And, but, but, the, but in 2016, it was, it was clear that, um, oh my gosh, this is quite the cluster. 2016, it was clear as I was breaking a new setter in uh, that he was very comfortable uh, just chucking it to the gun wherever he was at, front row or back row. That was a security blanket for him, and um, that's what every setter needs. They need a security blanket, and the gun is a security blanket. You also need a defensive uh, floor general. You hope it's your libero. Maybe it's one of the, maybe it's the gun also, or maybe it's the outsides that play in the back, but you need a dominant defensive presence in the back row that's shifting and and pointing and putting everybody where they're supposed to be. And you need leadership, you need captains, um, and you need role players. I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple, but I remember the 2016 season was the season where I wrote these things out numerous times, and then 
I would kind of try to place each player in which role I thought that they des- they belonged in and um, what their redeeming qualities were um, because of that. Um, and we, 2016, we tied for first place and we got, so, I mean, we tied for first place. We split with the, um, with our rivals and it was, um, that was a pretty, that was a pretty special season. Um, the gun graduated the following year, um, we had a more balanced attack, but definitely multiple guns um, that the setter could could get to, could get. Um, so we had multiple security blankets, which I think is probably the mark of a great team is if you have more, if you got guns everywhere. Um, and we had, we had all of it, but um, I think we just, I'm not sure what I, I'm not sure, I'm going to have to think about that one. I think I'm losing steam on the um, on the seasons, but I know that. Gosh, I've been talking for over an hour now, and I'm not even I'm not even one percent bored about it. <laughs> but I think also um, there's just so many things that can happen in this sport. That's why I love it so much. Um, and there's so many, there's so many things you, you can't uh, replicate in practice also, which is a challenging part too. Um, but I love it for that too. Um, 2017, we, we had, uh, my setter was back. My setter had caught the bug and, uh, I think, gosh, that's what I realized is that, um, the setter position is so very, very important. Um, because the previous year was the year I uh, I broke in a new setter for the first time. The previous setter had been with me for three seasons. One on JV, the year that we went uh, like undefeated, um, and that was a super small squad. That was ten dudes, and then he followed with me for his junior and senior season um, as the varsity setter, and. Um, so in 2016, when I was breaking in a new setter, it would be a junior kid of my first class as a as a head coach, and um, he was green. Um, but it, the guy I had thought would be the uh, the setter as a sophomore turned out to be more precious to us um, as a libero. So he ended up being all channel league first team libero as a sophomore year, and. Um, but he, he, he was a, just a good all around. He could play everything. Um, so we needed him to, to um, play Lieb. And then so the guy that set um, had only played high school. And, you know, he figured out his security blanket. He figured out the gun. But um, I think he just fell in love with the sport so much. And he ended up playing club after that. Um, his senior year, he played club. He came back looking so much more mechanically sound and um just so much more into it and like such a better leader I think being new to setting he didn't feel comfortable being the leader above uh above our guy um and rightfully so uh this guy was you know from a family of volleyball players he was going to be the fourth one of his four siblings to go to college to play volleyball he had been born and bred for it and and he was a natural born leader and and still is um and so you know it didn't make sense for that new setter to as a junior as he's trying to learn how to set the the varsity level to also take on the uh, importance of trying to be a leader that year too but the next year he he did and i'll always remember that we were gonna go play one of the um third or fourth place uh, fourth or fifth place teams of five of our five team league and he was the one that piped up and said we can't overlook this team this is you know basically saying this is kind of a trap game we got to have our head on a swivel and we have to execute and we can't give them any breaks and we can't go easy on them and um I always think about that day not that I hadn't said that before but 
when it comes from your leader, I think it holds a lot more weight. Um, because it's not me saying it. It's someone that's going to be in the trenches with you guys that's saying it. That'll be out there. And so I think he wants everybody to match his or hers um, energy and about about the importance of it all. So, um, yeah, that was pretty crucial. And, and that guy ended up um, coaching for me later on in life, I think maybe three years later or during – the pandemic season and the season after and then he's he's in he's always around he's kind of in and out but he's a young dude trying to figure out his life and um but um there is a time where i thought if you know he was going to be around he would be a great person to take over for me afterwards but um like i said it's such a it's such a such a obscure job that you really have to be um ready for it you can't be you gotta have like a career and be here anyways um yeah and the following year 2018 was uh was the senior year of a of a group of kids that all came through together um as freshmen they all three played JV as freshmen and they were super experienced and their volleyball IQ was um, I mean mainly the kid that was the libero before and then um, is that right? No he was libero I'm sorry in 2016 and then oh gosh that's right he got he got beat out in 2017 for libero and he was beat out in my eyes in the center position as well and that was a tough year for him and his dad because they had assumed a lot but um he ended up being a back row ds for our right side and set maybe like a a 25 percent of the season in a 6-2 or like my my setter went to fucking like Paris or some shit over spring break so he said that time but um yeah that was uh so yeah that's another thing that was maybe I learned about parents that year (laughs) but um in 2018 that guy ends up taking the reins and um he was by far like the most volleyball IQ savvy of, of any of my players he knows the game really well and he's been doing I think that might be the most experienced uh, player I ever got to coach um it seemed like he wouldn't wasn't very coachable at times but he was just in his own way and um he was pretty uh reticent to sort of like uh, letting you know what you were seeing as a coach from the floor that maybe he couldn't see but I mean the things that come to mind was just he he knew the right time when to set the pipe and he also knew like we played an AG in a heated five set match and he he did a back he did a left handed flipper over his head at the end of the fifth set and dropped and no one was paying attention to that and I think that was for like 14 10 or something it was it was one of the most um it was one of the smarter plays I've ever I've ever seen someone make and uh I don't know that just just sticks out in my mind so vividly um and he's another guy that's been around coaching a little bit here and there fuck thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you um but He's just trying to figure his life out too, but there's been a few guys I would I would love to get uh, to come help me out and possibly take over my position. But um, easier said than done. That is 100. percent And I'm trying to get some food too. Oh man, what's this? What's this? What's this? I think we're just gonna stop it there. I think I'm getting hoarse, man. This is going to be the longest pod that I've ever done before. Thank God it's only with myself, right? Um, But 
this is cool. I know that I know that I can talk <laughs> a lot more, man. Maybe I'll just break every season. Maybe I'll just try and s- speak on each season as much as I possibly can and, until until I go until I go horse. Um, that might be the name. There's something over here. Um, and maybe I'm going to have to figure out what my favorite season was. Um, that could be fun. Is this some McDougal's, dude? I don't know. Maybe I'll pop over there. I don't know. But, man, I was really, uh, just looking forward to, I love these drives, man. Even before I started talking to myself as much, I was just... I just, love, I just love driving and I guess being by myself and l- listening to music or just doing whatever whatever floats my boat not feeling like uh, I don't know introvert I think that's just it dude I don't really want McDonald's what else is there over there and my my wife and I are trying to budget better, but um, I have a couple bucks in cash so it's not gonna go on the credit card this one Um, yeah, I think those are all my thoughts in a van today I think I'll see you guys next week